Hello everybody, welcome to Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. I'm so glad you tuned into this broadcast today. In just a moment, you and I are gonna get into the Word of God together. We're gonna take you into a message that came from right here at Legacy Church, Green Mountain Falls, Colorado, right here in this sanctuary. And I'm telling you, the Word of God has the anointing on it to change your life. And what we're going to get into today is so, so important. We're going to talk about guarding the heart. Now, we've been talking some about this, but you need, you need to prioritize this in your life. The Bible says more than anything else you guard, guard your heart. So that's what we're going to get into today. Before we get into that, though, let me give you an update about some of the things that are taking place here at Legacy Church in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado, and through the outreaches of Pearson's Ministries International. Right now, the local church family here at Legacy and the global partner family of Pearson's Ministries, we are involved together in a plan to expand project. Now, if you've been watching the broadcast, you know what I'm talking about. If that's new to you, let me read to you something the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 54. Verse 2 says, enlarge the place of your tent. Skip down to verse 3. It says, you shall expand. He said, enlarge, and he said, expand. And that's what the Lord has assigned us to do right now. We are expanding in three big areas in this church and ministry, inside, outside, and worldwide. Now our inside expansion has to do with building out some new spaces here in the church so that our families have room to fellowship with each other. We're building out a lobby, which will in turn affect some of our children's areas. Uh, we're just building out place for people to gather together and fellowship and spend time with each other. And we are so excited about it. Take a look at some of these pictures. This is what we believe this space is going to look like, what it's going to feel like. And uh, for those of you who have been coming to the church and you've been here before, you know this is a far cry from where we are, but we're seeing the grace of God help us get this done. And we've made excellent progress. We've released faith for a million dollars to get this project started, which doesn't only include the lobby that you've just seen, but we, some expansion that takes, needs to take place outside the building. And then, of course, our worldwide expansion. That's taking legacy television and getting it out to more places and to more people all over the world. And uh, we're making awesome progress. As a matter of fact, let me show you this. This is how much progress we've made so far. This is the funds that have come in. And really, this is before work even gets started. So the Lord has helped us so much. And if he can get us this far, he can get us all the way. And we are believing right now, Sarah and I, our staff, our team, we're believing God for you to expand. Anybody who's sowing into this project, we're in agreement with you for expansion in your life, your family, your finances, your business, your ministry, whatever you set your hand to do. We believe big things are in front of you, expansion and enlarging of every kind. So if you would like to, if you want to sow into this expansion project today, there's a number of ways you can get involved. You can give online at pearsonsministries.com. You can text your offering by just texting LTV in any dollar amount to 28950, and that's for those of you inside the United States. Or if you'd like to write a check, you can make it payable to Pearson's Ministries International and use the address that you see on your screen. All right, let's get into the Word of God together and stay tuned to the end of this broadcast. I'll be back to pray with you at the end. Man, we're excited about the promises. We're excited about the blessing that we see in it. We're excited about all the things it'll do for you and it'll heal you and it'll strengthen you. And man, we believe all that stuff, don't we, church? Yeah. But one of the big functions of the Word of God is to correct us. That's one of the big things His Word does. And He corrects us by showing us what's right. And when you see what's right, you can make adjustments and make changes. But listen, if it's been a long time since you've heard any correction or received any correction, you're not listening close enough. You're not coming at the Word with the right heart. We've got to come to the place where we're, we're not just open to correction. We're looking for it because we love it. Because the Bible says who he loves, he corrects. And I know some people are going, man, he must really love me. <laughs> Maybe he does. He does really love you. But what are you doing with it? How are you receiving that correction? When somebody confronts you and says, hey, what you said was not right. What you did was not right. Here's the scripture that shows what is right, and that was not. When's the last time you said, I'm sorry, you're right. I can tell you it was a long time because it's not normal. It's not natural. 
We don't like to do that. We don't like to acknowledge that. But if you, instead of responding with just humility and correction, if you just resist it, well, no, 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 no. That's not what I said. That's not what I meant. Isn't it funny how we judge everybody else by what they did, but we judge ourselves by what we meant? That's not what I meant. Or you come up with all these other excuses. Well, they said, and they did, and so that's because, and you got excuse after excuse after excuse. Be careful because what's happening is you're being rebuked, but you're resisting it. And every time you do, there's friction on your heart. And it's building up layers of hardness. In Ephesians chapter 4, y'all are quiet. I get it. I know. It'll get good. In Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 25. The Spirit of God is saying through Paul here, writing to us, this church, but we're part of it. He said, therefore, putting away lying. I want you to say hardness. hardness. Lying is hardness. It's a heart condition. I mean, if you tell a lie, and let's say it's the first lie you ever told. Think back on that, and you might have to go back a ways. But remember that, and you might remember your heart really bothering you. Man, you knew that wasn't true. Somebody said to you, did you do this? And you did it, and you know you did it. But instead of saying, yes, I did, you said, no, I didn't. Or you started blaming somebody else or making excuses. But when you told that lie, if you, if you knew how to look inside, man, your heart was bothering you. <laughs> My heart bothered me so much. Oh, man, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. But here's the deal. If it starts bothering you and you don't go acknowledge right away, I'm sorry, I lied to you. What I said was not true. Yes, I did do it. If you fail to acknowledge that and you just hide it, did you notice the next time you lied? It may have still been hard, but it wasn't as hard. And then the time after that, what's happening? It's getting a little easier and easier. And every time you tell a lie, guess what's happening? Friction. You ever said this phrase before? Something just rubbed me funny about that. It's friction. Something's rubbing you wrong on the inside. Ah, that's not good. I don't like that. And if you don't acknowledge it, a little bit of hardness builds up. And then the next time you do it, it's a little easier. And then it becomes actually to the point where not only is it easy, it's natural. It just flows out of you to say something that's not true, that's a lie. And here's Paul writing to this church. I mean, would you have to write to church people and say, put away lying? Evidently, you would. So lying is the result of what? Hardness, the hardness of heart. He said, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. We're members of one another. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. What's, what's, what's the heart condition that's producing all this anger all the time? Hardness of heart. If you're angry, he said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't let it hang out. Because anger tolerated, anger in the heart, it, it, it's like rubbing you funny. It's friction on the inside, and it's making the heart harder and harder and harder. He said in verse 27, don't give place to the devil. You're lying, anger tolerated. This is all opening up the door to the devil in your life. He's coming to steal the word from a hard heart. He said, let him who stole steal no longer. If you ever stole something when you were a kid, Man, it bothered your heart. I know it did mine. Because I remember the day around Christmas time, we were walking through a department store and I saw a little Santa Claus on a shelf <laughs> that I thought, I want that. And I will never forget this. His leg was broke. I don't know why I remember that, but I just remember this little gimpy Santa Claus laying on that, just about that big. And I reached over, I grabbed it and I put it in my pocket. I don't know, six or eight years old. And I got home, and man, it bothered me. I was tore up on the inside, and I went to mom and dad and said, I stole this, and I should, and I'm sorry. So guess what we did? 
back in the car, back to the store, find the manager. I stole this. <laughs> Something was rubbing me funny on the inside. Friction. But what happens if you don't acknowledge that and you try it again? It gets a little easier. And it gets a little easier. And then all of a sudden, stealing just sort of becomes a way of life without you realizing it. And it's easy to steal. It's easy to steal from work by being on Facebook when they're paying you to do something else. It's easy to steal. huh? It's easy to cheat people out of things because, you know, everybody does it. But that's only because the heart has gotten hard. He said, let him who stole, would you have to tell church people, quit stealing stuff. Let him who stole steal no longer. But rather, let him labor with his hands uh, what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That word corrupt, it just means worthless. It means putrid. It, it literally has a stench to it. Stop letting this stuff come out of your mouth. Because the more it comes out of your mouth and you don't acknowledge, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, your heart's getting harder and your heart's getting harder. He said, but let him say or speak what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve him. I don't want you to turn there, but if we had time to go back and look at the book of Hebrews chapter three, it talks all about, well, let me just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. Listen to this. In Hebrews three, Hebrews 3, 7 says it like this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you're going to hear his voice, he said, don't harden your heart. See, that's what this whole thing is about. It's hearing the word of God, receiving the word of God. That's God speaking to you. Don't sit there and say, well, God never speaks to me. Open the book. That's him speaking to you. Set your eyes on it. Read some red words you just heard from Jesus. But just looking at it is not the end of it. It's got to get in, right? And you've got to have a guard that receives it and keeps it in. And if the heart's hard, then you're not hearing it. It's like not hearing it at all. And that's why he connects here, you hearing his voice to the hardness of the heart. He said, today, if you're going to hear his voice, don't harden your heart as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me, saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry. The King James Bible says, I was grieved with them. Now, it's not a happy thought, and I'm not encouraging you to hang out here, but God can get angry. There are things that grieve him. Didn't we just read in Ephesians 4, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He, God is saying, I was grieved with them. I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways. He said, I swore in my wrath. God is not happy. He said, they will not enter my rest. Beware, brethren. Wait a second. I was fine as long as we were talking about them Old Testament people. But now all of a sudden, what's he say? Beware, brethren. Watch out, family. Is this something that New Testament, born-again, spirit-filled believers have got to watch out for? Yes, yes it is. Is this something we have got to be on our guard? Yes, it is. Beware, brethren. Watch out, brothers. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. We should be encouraging each other with this every day. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we've become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Is this not like the third or fourth time he said it in the last several verses? If you're going to hear from him, your heart can't be hard. If you're going to receive from him, your heart can't be hard. For who, having heard, rebelled? He said, indeed, was it not all who came out of, G uh, out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's the hardness of their heart. They refused to believe. 
I don't want to take the time to go back, but these people are an amazing case study of what not to do. See what they did and don't do it. I mean, God had to work with these people. And it was like, it, when, he, when he brought them out of Egypt, he delivered them. And he had this other place, right? This promised land that he had intended for them to dwell in. He promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to their descendants. And when he brought them out of Egypt, you know what he said to them? Okay, I'm with you. Now go up and possess the land. And you know what they said? No, we can't. There's too many tall people. We can't do it. We're not going. And then God, it made him angry. And he spoke through Moses, told them they had sinned. And they said, oh, no, we've sinned. Come on, let's go up. And God said, you better not go. Don't go up now. I'm not with you. And they said, no, 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 we're going up. So when he said go, what'd they say? We're not going. Then when he said don't go, what'd they say? Oh, we're going. And you know what? It looked like faith. It sounded like faith. Every man, grab his sword. We're going to go possess the land. But it's not faith if God said don't go. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if he said don't go, what can you have faith to do? Don't go. Don't go. And God, I mean, he spoke to these people. They're saying we're hungry. We're tired of eating this. And so God said, fine, I'm going to rain some food down. And they came out and they said, manna, what is it? And God told them what it was. And he said, look, I'm going to give this to you every day. Go out, gather it up. But he said, don't, don't store it. Don't save it. So you know what they did? Saved it. <laughs> and the Bible says it stank and it bred worms. And then he said, now you collect it six days, but on the, seven, on the sixth day, you collect enough for two and it won't spoil. I'm going to provide for two days, but don't go out on the seventh. That's the day of rest. Don't go out that day. Don't collect that day. So guess what they did? They went out that day, right? You know, and you know what the Bible calls this? Hard-heartedness. And it's amazing that God didn't look at these people and go, you guys, y'all are so cute. You're just little free spirits, aren't you? you? You're just such independent thinkers. And I get it. I know. You're curious and, and you want to figure it out for yourself. Well, I'm just a free spirit. I, I'm just a, a free and independent thinker. Oh, you mean you have a hard heart? Because when it comes to the word of God and, and when he's speaking to you, this is not your time to be a free spirit and a free thinker. And there are people, you know them and I know them. I just don't want to be one of them. Those who are hardwired to do the opposite of whatever they're told. Come here. I ain't going there. Stay there. I'm coming there. <laughs> Jump. I'm sitting down. Sit down. I'm jumping. There are people, and it's in them just to resist, resist, resist. I know when Sarah and I first started in our ministry, the Lord had blessed us with a little twin-engine Cessna airplane. Um, not a big airplane, not a fast airplane. It had kind of a, a relatively low ceiling level where we could only fly up to about 20, 22,000 feet, which meant we couldn't really get around weather as good as some of these jets that could get up high. Well, we had been invited to minister at a church in another state, and it was in February of that year, and this would have been, I guess, 2011. And um, I remember that year, that winter, it was like snowing in America. It was ice and snow across the country. And this pastor had invited us to minister. And he and I talked on the phone, and there was some rough weather. And he said, will you all pray about it and whether or not we need to reschedule? And, and so Sarah and I prayed. We talked to each other, and we just talked to the Lord and said, are we supposed to go? Do we go now or do we wait? And it, it came up in our hearts, just wait. Don't push it. Don't go. And I'm not saying we got some word necessarily, audible word from God. It just seemed peaceful to us to not go. You understand what I mean? So when he says, don't go, what can we have faith to do? Don't go, right? And I told the pastor, we talked about it, and he was good with it. I was on the phone with somebody kind of explaining the situation to them. And when I told him, yeah, we're going to delay and, and wait, this guy said to me, you know, that's probably fine. You know, some people have great faith. Some people have great faith, and they just push on through, and they're fine. You know, you just got to go with where you're at. And man, the Lord caught my attention. 
it stood out to me. And I could just sense the Lord saying, this is why people are missing it. Misunderstanding faith. I preached a message not long after that, how I survived a plane crash. You want to know how I survived it? I didn't go. I can have faith to stay when he says stay. But a hard heart, if the Lord says stay, what's a hard heart do? I'm going. Bless God, I'm going. Psalm 91 in full effect. I dwell in the secret place. He gives his angels charge. Guess where my angels are that day? My house. Because that's where he told me to be. You understand what I'm saying? That's what these people were doing. And God's so frustrated with it. And it grieved him. Literally made him angry. Let me read a few. Oh, excuse me. Let me read a few of these to you from the ministry of Jesus. I told you I had a lot here. Mark chapter 3. Before we go any further, if a hard ground, if a good ground is a good heart, then hard ground is a hard heart. So if you want to be good ground, what do you know right away? Just by studying the bad, what do you know good ground is? Soft. I, I moved too quickly. Back to Ephesians chapter 4. He said in verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He said, Let all bitterness say hardness. hardness. Wrath say hardness. Anger, Arthur. clamor, Arthur. evil speaking, Arthur. all of these things are the result of a hard heart. He said, put them away from you with all malice. And instead, verse 32, be kind to one another. Well, there's a thought. There's an idea. Be kind to one another. And what else? Tender hearted. If bad ground is, is hard, then bad heart is a hard heart. Well, that, that, what does that tell you? A good ground is soft. It's tender. It's a heart. It's a ground that the seed can penetrate. Well, that's what a good heart is, tender. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Can you handle just a few more minutes of this? Jesus... In the book of Mark, let me just read it to you. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. There were religious people expecting Jesus to heal. I wish we had that much faith. Watch this. Watch him. Just, just watch him. He's going to heal somebody. No, you just wait. I've seen it. You just wait here and watch. He, he's going to heal. Somebody's getting healed today. The only thing is they're watching, and according to the scripture, they're looking for something they might have to accuse him. Um, we don't want this in us. People who are constantly looking for something they can use to accuse somebody of, guess what they're going to find? Something they can use to accuse somebody Fault finders are people who are just fault seekers. And that's this, the spirit that was at work in these religious people. You don't want that in you. Listen to me. You don't want that in you. It's not hard to find something wrong. It's not hard to find something that should be or could be better. Congratulations. You have eyeballs. It's not hard. Come on, folks. We got to grow up. You come looking around here, guess what? You're going to find something that could be, should be better. But if you're constantly looking for something that you might use to accuse somebody with, you are a Pharisee. You are in this club. I don't want to be in that club. They're looking for something that they might accuse him with. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent, no response. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their heart. Anger, and he's grieved. 
We don't like to think of Jesus like this. Jesus walked around with a smile on his face all the time, didn't he? Yeah. Just loving and happy and, and, and so sweet to everybody. But here you see Jesus got ticked. He's angry and grieved at what? At what? At what? The hardness of their heart. How did he know their hearts were hard? Simple. He asked them a question and they didn't respond. Is it lawful? Is it right to heal this man today? Folks, talk about easy questions with easy answers, right? Duh. Yeah. It would be a good thing for this man's hand to not be withered anymore. But they kept silent. A hard heart is unresponsive. Before we leave the broadcast today, I want you to take a quick look around me. I am standing right now in what will be very soon the Legacy Church lobby. We're so excited about this. And if you've been watching the broadcast over the last several weeks, you know we're in the middle of a plan to expand project. And this room is a big part of that. We're believing God to expand inside, outside, and worldwide. Now, the inside expansion has everything to do with this space I'm in right now. And I know it doesn't look like much right now, but that's not how you and I live, man. We look through the eyes of faith, and we don't just look at what it is. We look at what it can be, what it should be, and by the grace of God, what it will be. Let me show you some of these pictures of what we believe this space is going to look like. It's going to be a beautiful area for the families of our church and our guests to come and fellowship in, to be welcomed in, and to just sit and, and commune with each other and get excited with each other about the things of God and the things of the Word. And we're so excited about this project. I want to give you an opportunity before we end this broadcast today to be a part of this plan to expand, this, this assignment to think bigger, to believe bigger. And the reason I open this up to you is because I believe every seed reproduces after its own kind. And as much as I want to see this space built out, I want to see you expanding. I want to see expansion taking place in your life, your family, your business, your ministry. And I'm going to declare it over you right now in Jesus' name that increases on its way to you and days of expansion are right in front of you. If you want to be a part of this, this project going on here at Legacy Church and Pearson's Ministries, there's a number of ways you can get involved. Just start by visiting us online at pearsonsministries.com. All the information you need is there about partnering with us and sowing specifically into this project. If you'd like to text your offering, if you're inside the United States, you can do that by texting LTV and any dollar amount to 28950. Or if you'd like to write a check, you can make it payable to Pearson's Ministries. Use the address that you see right there on your screen. But whatever you do, whether you're sowing into this or the Lord has some other place and some other assignment for you financially, do it in faith. That's what matters. Do it in love. That's what makes our seed, our gift, our offering acceptable to God. Father, we thank you for the giving of the people today. We receive it and we call them blessed in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Legacy TV.